And what I'd like to do is uh, ask you to do something with me. Would you just close your eyes for a few moments? Just close your eyes. Just shut them tight. And after you've done that, I want you to think about the person you trust most in your life, who that person is. The person you trust most in your life. Okay, you can go ahead and open your eyes. This morning, what I want to do is I want to talk about trust. I want to be speaking about trust these next few weeks because trust is so critical in any society and especially amongst uh, the people of God. Trust is a human capital. Trust is the basis for almost everything that we do in life. It's the foundation on which our laws are built, uh, on which contracts are made with one another. It's very fragile, and we have to maintain and take care of trust. Employers trust their employees every week to do their job, just as employees trust their employers to give them a paycheck every week after doing their job. How many know that's a good kind of trust? When you can trust your employer next week to show up after you put in your first week, that you're going to get a check back for the work that you've done. Trust is the reason why we're willing to exchange our hard-earned money for goods and services. When we go to the store, when we go to buy something, we trust that those things are going to be what they say they are, that they're going to work the way they say they're going to work after you paid for them. Most everything we do in life is based on trust. Trust is the reason why a man and a woman will take a vow and a vow to spend the rest of their life together till death do them part. It's based on trust. Trust is so, so important for you and I to understand how it works and the results of it when it is uh, utilized and taken care of because it is so, so fragile. Ministry is based on trust. God trusts the pastor to feed the sheep, to take care of the sheep. It's based on trust, on a relationship. The pastor trusts the leaders to encourage those that they lead to not abuse them, to not be cruel to them, but to love them and nurture them also because they are leaders. And uh, those that they are leading, they expect for those to be trustworthy as men and women of God. Trust is, 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 is a basis for all of our lives in the workplace. It is a basis uh, at school. When you go to school, it is a basis, especially in church. Stephen Covey said these words, Trust is the glue of life. It is the most essential ingredient in effective communication. It is the foundational principle that holds all relationships. They're based on trust. And it's sad to say that we're living in a time and a generation when people's trust in each other, public institutions, and government have reached a new low. We've all having to deal with those issues of trust. The Pew Research Group took this survey, and among adults in the United States, it said that more than twice as many Americans say that confidence in each other has dropped. Why? They went on to say because people are not as reliable and trustworthy as they used to be. Because everything should be based on trust. And this low level of trust 
has filtered into every area of life and sad to say even into the church of Jesus Christ. I know as a pastor I trust that leaders will be in church when the doors are open, that they will serve people and encourage people and, and guide people with the love of Christ and that God places uh, his trust on me as a senior pastor over this congregation uh, and churches to make sure that I am accountable to him for what takes place. Trust can be violated. Why? Because humanity is flawed. Nobody's perfect. How many can say amen? And when we put our faith in people, we put our faith in, 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 in sad to say, in people who run institutions and institutions run by people, there are going to be problems. But I've got good news for you this morning. When everybody else lets you down, when that government institution or that whatever it is that you've been uh, putting your trust in falls apart, whether it's a mortgage company or whether it's a bank, uh, whatever it might be, a 401k, let me tell you someone who is not flawed, who is perfect. Uh, he is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. You can put your trust in Him because there are no imperfections in him, and he can be trusted. And in a society today where people are searching for something to put their trust in, someone to put their trust in, man, we've got the upper hand because we are Christians. And the God that we serve can be trusted. And that's good news that can be spoken at that outreach next week in Palm Springs to let people know about the good news of a risen Savior that we just celebrated and that when you put trust and confidence in Him and in His Word, He will never let us down. And so these next few weeks, I'm going to be speaking about trust. And I'm going to be focusing on God and focusing on God's uh, word and how that impacts you and I and how it is the foundation of everything that we have to build on as the people of God is trust in God and in his word. Out of Proverbs chapter 3, and starting with verse 1, we're going to take a look this, this morning and for the next three weeks uh, at the principles uh, for successful Christian living. Principles for successful Christian living based on trust in the Word of God. Why is that so important? Because trust is the most important factor, number one, in knowing God and His will for your life. Because if you don't trust God, then you'll never know God's will for your life. Because sometimes God will lead us in places that we don't know where he's taking us. How many have ever been there? He's doing things in our life that, why God, are, are you doing this? And so in order to know the will of God, you've got to trust God completely. Trust is important because it helps expand, as I mentioned earlier, his kingdom when you trust God. For your life, you can tell other people about him and his faithfulness and how he leads us uh, faithfully. And we will grow as we trust God in our relationship with him and our love for him. Because when you trust someone, it's based upon a love for that person. How many know that's true? And so when you close your eyes at the beginning of the service and I asked you to to, to answer the question, who is it in your life that you trust the most? I would imagine that there were a myriad of different answers probably that came into your mind. Your husband, your wife, your job, your money, your car, your, your house, your 401k, your savings account, or this person or that person. But I wonder how many immediately when I say close your eyes and focus on that person that you trust the most in your life, how many said God? 
All right, that's good. We've got about a quarter of you. There's a quote that said, Trust is to human relationships what faith is to gospel living. It is the beginning place, the foundation upon which more can be built. Where trust is, love can flourish. So any successful relationship that we have in life needs to be built on the foundation of trust in order for it to succeed, especially our relationship with God. Because the bottom line is, if there's no trust there, then you really not be successful the way God wants you to experience success. You'll never experience success the way God has planned for you to be blessed in life. So this morning in the, in the four-part series, this first uh, title is going to be Trusting God. Trusting God. Because that's where it all begins, the foundation. So let's build that foundation out of Proverbs chapter 3, starting with verse 1. When you have that, say amen. Take notes also this, this month. We should take mo- notes every, every time we come to church. But see, I want you to, to not just hear what I'm saying and say, oh, it must be true. Thank you for trusting me. <laughs> but I want you to trust God's word. I want you to turn to God's word and verify what I'm saying because we need to do that with the Word of God. Because you learn that way. You begin to build confidence that way when you know God's Word. So in Proverbs 3.1, my child, it says, remember my teachings and instructions and obey them completely. If we obey His teachings and instructions completely, say that word with me, completely, not partially, completely, then, then, We will live a long and prosperous life. Let love and loyalty always show like a necklace and write them in your mind. That's what I said. Remember God's word. Let them be a part of your mind, his promises. In verse 4, And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. When you do these things completely, let them be a part of your life You're going to be successful. You'll find favor with God. How many want favor with God? I want favor with God. I want favor in his eyes. And you'll find, be a success with people around you. Verse 5 and 6, with all your heart, you must trust the Lord. And not our own judgment. Always let him lead you. And he will clear the road for you to follow. You see, there's some powerful words here, and uh, there's some some powerful uh, uh, key words that speak to you and I that give us the guidance and the instructions that we are to follow in order for God to bless us. And then in verse 7, don't ever think that you are wise enough. Don't think you're smarter than God. But respect the Lord And stay away from evil because when you respect God and you know that he's smarter than you, you'll stay away from from evil. It won't overtake you. In verse 8 and 10, he will make you healthy. Wow, I could use more health in my body, could you? I, I I want to be more healthy. And he will, and you will feel strong. Yes. Honor the Lord by giving him your money and the first part of all your crops, then you will have more grain and grapes than you will ever need. I think God has given us instruction here. He's given us uh, um, a, a, a foundation for success in life, for the principle to be successful in our marriage, in raising our children, in our workplace, in our relationship with God, and with people. And it's built upon trusting God. Because when he says that we do that completely, 
And with all of our heart, we trust him, not sometimes, but always. There are some things that he said are going to take place. And the lessons that we learned that God's commands, his word, he includes them. They're not excluded from, from any part of our life, from when we're at school or we're at work or we're at the mall. But they're all inclusive. They matter always. As we live and breathe, we should always apply and remember the, the instructions of God in his word, that we're to obey them, not some of the time, some of the instructions when it's convenient, but he said, with all of our hearts and always let him lead me. Total obedience are a requirement for you and I, not an option. If we're going to experience success in our life, total trust in God with all of our hearts. And he says when you do that, his commands, then the promise will come. The command always precedes the promise. If you do this, when you do these things, he says, then I will do such and such for you. In other words, when we do our part, how many know God always does his part? God will never ever fail us or let us down. We can trust him when we are faithful and obedient and uh, we are, are confident in him and he leads us always, not just sometimes. God always comes through. He says, then you will have more grain and grapes than you will ever need. That's talking about provision and fruitfulness. Since Nancy and I have been serving Jesus since 1975, I want to tell you something. We have never been more blessed in our lives than we are now. I'll tell you why. We have not been, it's, uh, it's not perfection because we're not perfect. No one's perfect. But to the best of our ability, through every, every journey, part of our journey in Jesus from our being new converts to different parts of ministry that we've been involved in, through planting churches and through everything involved in that and, and, and this church and ministry and so on, we've always trusted God to meet our needs of, of personally, in, in the churches that we pastored, with our children, in spite of, of sometimes them maybe not doing what they're supposed to, we always trusted that God had control and that all things would work out right. It's based on trust, because I guarantee you something. If at any time Nancy and I failed to trust God, we wouldn't have experienced the fruitfulness and the blessing that we've experienced throughout our 50 years of serving Him. We would never have experienced that. And it's all based on trust. When this church was being, being built and the bank was calling, we need the payment. We need the next payment. And the contractor took off on us before it was finished. But we still need the next payment. We believe God that God was going to provide for the next payment. And God provided even though it looked like it was impossible. When we pioneered churches and our, our time was up, as I mentioned before, for the money that was coming in, our, our support to be cut, we believed God through every step of the way that God was going to meet the need, and God always did. It's all based on trust for you and for me is the bottom line. That's foundational because God is trustworthy. There is nothing that is untrustworthy about God. Isaiah 25 and verse 1. He writes, Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name. 
for in perfect faithfulness you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. See, he understood that there's a process in life that God uses as we trust him. There are things that, that he's planned for us that he will bring to pass, that he will bless us with. But it's all be based on where we are right now and what's going on in our life right now. And when we are faithful here and our confidence in him is, 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 is trust, trusting him, no matter what, God has great things planned ahead. Great things planned for you, your family, your marriage, this ministry. God is trustworthy. Why is that critical? Because the devil will always try to get you and I to doubt God. To doubt his trustworthiness and to doubt that he cares for us. Are you sure God loves you? Are you sure God cares for you? Are you, are you sure he's going to meet your need? Isn't that what the devil does? It's what he does. And it's foundational that when those lies come, those doubts come into our mind, because that's where the battle is, right here, that we are able to cast them down. Every imagination, as Paul says, and the reason we're able to cast them down is because of our trust in God. He says, no, 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 devil, that doesn't line up with God's word. What you're telling me, no matter what I feel, think, or see, you telling me those things doesn't line up with what God has promised me. And so you're a liar. Because God is trustworthy. His care is constant, no matter what we feel or think in Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews chapter 13. and verse 5 and 6, it says, God has said. You see, that's critical. When God says it, then it must be so. Isn't that right? God said it. So what? Do we doubt it? No. We believe it. See, that's trust. That's trusting God. And the problem that we have so many times, let me just stop there, is because we are human. And, and, and we've been let down by people, by, by parents, by children, by friends, but never by God. And so sometimes we come into a relationship with God kind of, kind of uh, in, in a sense, where, well, I'm not so sure about this because, man, life has messed me up. But see, when God says something, the creator of heaven and earth and the universe, then we need to base uh, our confidence in him, knowing that it's going to be okay. And no matter what's gone on around us or who did what, God can always be counted upon. And so it says, God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Do you believe that this morning? You trust God for that, that promise this morning? Yeah, we got to trust him for that promise. So it says, so we can say with confidence, not, well, maybe it's so. Or, yeah, it could be in this situation. And, yeah, I can trust them over here in this little thing here. No, we say in confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? You see, the devil is a liar. And when the enemy comes in to try to bring doubt and to try to get you to not trust God, uh-uh, you confidently say, in Jesus' name, I know who God is and what he promised me. Constant care and love. Without doubt. Do you ever have something slip out of your hand? You're holding on to it, and, and, and psh, it slipped out, and you lost it. Never money, I know that, because we hold on to it tight. <laughs> Nancy and I, the other day, were, were, uh, went a while ago, bought some, an, an ice cream cone. And, you know, I'm 
we're walking in the street and she's eating her ice cream cone and I'm, I'm eating mine. And I squeezed it to take a bite and poof. I mean, I just bought it. It was big. And it just poof, right in the street. I gripped it and it slipped out. But you know, this morning, God, God never, his grip never slips. God's hold on us is always tight. It's always secure, and it's always constant. Isaiah chapter 41. I like the message version. They may not put that one up there, but that's the one I'm reading from. Sorry, guys. 41, verse 11, Isaiah. He says, count on it. Everyone who had it in for you will end up out in the cold. Real losers, those who worked against you will end up empty-handed, nothing to show for their lives. When you go out looking for your old adversaries, you won't find them. Not a trace of your old enemies, not even a memory. That's right, because I, your God, have a firm grip on you and I'm not letting go. I'm telling you, don't panic. I'm right here to help you. Praise God. I like that version. Because God says when, when things are crazy and when things are going nuts around you and this is going on and that one's happening, hey, God's got a firm grip. Don't worry about it. Chill out. Be cool. It's going to be okay. Calmate. You'll be fine because God's in control. We have all, most of us probably, at one time or another have read the poem called Footprints. And that's such a powerful poem because it illustrates what I'm talking about right now. I want to read it to you quickly. One night a man had a dream and he dreamed that he was walking along the beach with the Lord. Across the sky flashed scenes of his life, and for each scene he noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to him and the other belonging to the Lord. He noticed that many times along the path of his life there was only one set of footprints, and he also noticed that it happened at the very lowest and uh, at uh, the very saddest times of his life. This really bothered him, and he questioned the Lord about it. How many have ever questioned God? I think we all have been there. He said, Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand. Lord, why? When I needed you the very most, you would leave me. And the Lord reply, replied, My precious child, I love you, and I would never leave you. During those times of trial and suffering, when you see only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. You see, God's grip don't slip. And he's with us during those troublesome times, those times we're in storms, uh, don't worry, because God is there holding us up. No matter what the devil says, God can be trusted. 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your cares on him, for he cares for you. God's care is constant, and we can cast those anxieties, those concern, those worries uh, on him. You can trust him, because God's love never fails. Have you ever failed someone in love? Have you ever failed someone who trusted you and thought they thought you loved them, but you failed them in an area, and, well, I thought you loved me. You know, kids are always saying that. If you loved me, you would have bought me this. Right? That's the way kids are. I thought you loved mom and dad must not, must not love us because they didn't take us to Disneyland. 
They must not love us because they didn't buy us the toys we wanted for Christmas. I think somewhere along the line we have all failed someone in some way concerning love. God, his care is not only constant, but so is his love. He's generous in his love and provision to us. You know, people base love on things, as I mentioned earlier. If if you love me, you'll do this. If you love me, you'll get me this. You know, I think about couples who are getting engaged. And they go looking for the engagement ring. And the bigger the diamond, whoo, they must really love you. (laughs) Right? When she shows it to to, to her girlfriends, and says, boy, that man really loves you. But then the one that's got that little speck for a diamond, <laughs> wow, I thought he loved you. <laughs> right? We're, all, we're always looking at, 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 at things, uh, and we base our love based on those things and how much people love us. But see, God doesn't work that way. Someone said the shape of true love isn't a diamond, but it's a cross. And God's love went beyond the things of this world and what this world could offer, but he gave his life for you and I. That when we love him and we we call on his name and accept him as our Lord and Savior, his love will cover that multitude of sins. That's the love that, that, that no one else can match. That God's love is the greatest for those who may be searching for love in different ways and areas and in people. He loves me better than that one and she loves me better than that one. And that thing makes me feel like I'm loved more than that thing does. Uh, you need to stop all of that and turn to Jesus Christ because he is the lover of humanity. And he gave his life on the cross of Calvary to show his love for us. God's love never fails. How many can say amen? When people's love fail us, when the world's love and the things the world has falls apart, God's love never fails. Psalm 136. It says, praise the Lord for he is good. God's love never fails. Praise God of all gods because God's love never fails. Praise the Lord of lords. God's love never fails. Only God works great miracles. God's love never fails. With wisdom he made the sky. God's love never fails. Uh, The Lord stretched the earth over the ocean. God's love never fails. He made the bright lights in the sky. God's love never fails. He let the sun rule each day. God's love never fails. He let the moon and the stars rule each night. God's love never fails. How many times did the psalmist say God's love never fails? Think about that. In every verse that he said, he closed it out with God's love never fails. That speaks to us this morning. Because every time God makes a statement to you and I, and he gives us direction, remember the psalmist said, he, I, he lead me in all my ways. Every time God makes a statement to you and I, he speaks to us, asks us something, gives us guidance. We need to come back with the response, God's, God's love never fails. And not question it. And I say, well, are you sure, God? Because God wouldn't ask us to do something because he loves us that would harm us. How many believe that this morning? He would never ask us to do something that would hurt us because he loves us. Trust, someone said, is like love. Both parties have to feel it before it really exists. And that's so true, isn't it? In closing this morning, we are, God has called us. He has entrusted us. We trust God, and so God in return trusts us as trustees of all that he's given to us, that he's put in our hands, that he's caused us to be responsible for possessions, opportunities, talents, 
our time, everything that God has given us on earth, we have been entrusted with that. I know it's easy to say, yes, I trust God completely. Sure, I obey God completely. So then let's ask ourselves a couple of questions. Is he really, do I trust him to be my source? Your source, not just for today, for next, next week or month, but for the rest of your life. Do you trust God to be your source? Do I trust him, the second question, in everything, or do I trust him in just some things? God, I trust you here, but over here I'm not so sure. I trust you, God, in the small things, but in the big, big, big things, God, you know, um, maybe I better handle it. And these two questions are important because when you can honestly answer these two questions, number one, do I trust God as my source? And do I trust God in everything? It's when you're going to grow more in maturity as a Christian. And you're going to grow more in your confidence and love with God. We can answer those two completely. Because, and again, I'll use our examples, Sister Nancy and myself. The times that, that we went out to plant churches, the things that we did through, throughout our Christianity, the in ministry or planting churches, had to be a, been done because we trusted God completely. Without reservation, and because we did, we grew in maturity. And so I had to trust in God more than I trusted my job. Because I would have never gone out and pioneered where I went, where we went, if I, we couldn't do that. Because Sister Nancy worked too. And because of that, we were able to grow in our love for God, obviously, confidence, and maturity as Christians throughout the process of our salvation for the 49 plus years. So the same holds true for you. Can you say you trust God as your source completely in all areas of your life? How do I do that? Some keys to trusting God as uh, I wind this down or music group can make their way up this morning. Keys to developing our trust in God. Number one, trust God in adversity. I shared a little bit about it earlier. Trust him when things are looking bad, when things aren't good. The psalmist said in our text, we're to trust and obey God in every aspect of our life, not just in the good times, but in adversity in storms and in bad times that we call bad times. Psalm 56 and verse 4. And we're going to be looking at this issue of trust for three more weeks. So don't stay home. Invite somebody to come back, to come to church. Let's fill this place up with people because I guarantee you, people are looking to trust someone and something. That someone is Jesus Christ. That something is the Word of God. Psalms 56, verse 4. For God, in God I trust. I will not be afraid. I think that's where our forefathers and our government got the idea for the quote on our money. In God we trust. In Psalm 34, and verse 4. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. And he delivered me from all of my fears. What David is saying, that it's about trust and the willingness to say yes to God in every situation. Just say yes. He said, I trust you, and I'm not going to be afraid, even when I don't understand everything. Even when I don't get it, or I don't see it, 
or I don't feel it. Yes, God, I'll do it. I trust you. Even when things are bigger than me, I trust you. Not God, how are you going to work it out? Not God, if I surrender this to you, how is, how are you, how are you going to make it up? If I pay my tithes, God, how is everything going to come? No, not that way. But God, yes, I trust you without reservation. That's why Jesus said we have to be like little children. Because how many know kids trust? Kids, kids trust. You tell them, go over there, and okay, I'll go over there, usually. Yeah, we've been affected in life. We're older. We've been beat up, up and down, backwards and forwards with life, all of us. But don't let that cause you not to trust God. Secondly, trust God in plenty. Not only in adversity, trust Him when things are going great, when you are on top of the world. And this becomes a place where we have conflict because there's a tendency to trust in either ourselves or in the blessing that God has given to us. Isn't that true? During those times of ease, those times of prosperity, times of blessing, things are going good, everybody, everybody's cool, we have a tendency to kind of filter off, don't come to church as much anymore. Man, it's only Wednesday. I don't need to come to church on Wednesday. It's only for whoever. We have a tendency to start to pull back. So human. We run to God when we have problems, but we kind of ignore them when we're blessed. Then the last thing I want to look at is trust God as your source. I mentioned that already. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Righteous run to it and are safe. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city and they imagine it to be an unscalable wall. So what he's saying is, those that trust in the Lord, they're going to have safety. They're going to be okay. But the ones who trust in their things, their talent, their money, their, their gifts, they're going to look at those things as their protection, their wall, their source. Two different contrasts here. So this morning, you have walls built up that you're trusting in beyond God? Do you have a trust issue with God? Is there something that you are confident more in than God? Then as we bow our heads and close our eyes for a few moments, 